The scripture lesson this morning comes from Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 22 to 40. The sermon today is, is not really a sermon, as it is a message. And it actually really isn't even a message in one sense, as it is a story. Um, uh, a story with a reminder, perhaps, but uh, our scripture reading is on page 59 of the New Testament, and should you choose to follow along. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child, to do the same for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I am curious, and, and yet I'm not curious, because every single person in this room has accomplished something like a miracle in and of yourselves. Every man, woman, and child, at some point in your life, whether you do it or not, was a miracle to others or a blessing to others. Miracles are still alive and well in today's world. We hear so little of Jesus following the birth narratives, don't we? Luke, in chapter 2, verses 39 to 52, is about all we get of Jesus as a child. Now, that's after what I read this morning. What I read this morning was a lectionary reading. What I'm going to talk about today is not a lectionary text, but it is about the boyhood a bit of Jesus. And at the age of 12, he debates with the temple leaders. He questions the temple leaders. Scripture tells us that he grew in wisdom, that he uh, was both in divine and human favor. We assume that Jesus learned the trade of carpentry. How do we know that? Because Jesus is called Jesus Bar Joseph, the son of a carpenter. Years later, when Jesus returns to Nazareth, the people reject him. Matthew 13, verses 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? How could a man of such a humble trade be a servant or instrument of God? 
This is back when carpenters did not have the status that they have today. I mean, a carpenter, God incarnate? We say the Apostles' Creed, we talk about God incarnate, God in Christ, as a worker of wood. How is it that God is a carpenter when he created the entire world and everything in it and everything that will be? And yet he is in a little shop in Nazareth, pounding on wood. Mark 6, verses 1 to 3, Jesus leaves the place where he had been teaching. He had been teaching in parables, and he goes to his hometown, and the people tell him to go away and come back another day. Is this not the carpenter, they say, the son of Mary, with all of his brothers and sisters who grew up here? This Joseph, according to Matthew, is a carpenter. This Jesus, according to Mark, is a carpenter. Now, we don't really have to figure out that too much because Mark is the oldest gospel, and if Jesus is a carpenter, it follows that, of course, Matthew, writing later, would have talked about um, uh, Joseph being a carpenter. The word for carpenter in Greek is called tekton, T-E-C-K-T-O-N. Tekton, if uh, 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 Joseph was a tecton in Matthew 13, 55, then the same word is also applied in Mark 6, 3. Jesus was a tecton. What is a tecton? It's a builder. It could be a builder or a carpenter using wood. It could be a person who chisels or fashion, uh, fashions rocks. But in the first century AD, it was required for the father to teach his son the trade that he knew. And it follows that one so low who fashions wood certainly could not be a part of God's plan. The people of Nazareth say, away with you. And in Mark chapter 6, towards the end, it says that Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. So we have Jesus the carpenter, Jesus the carpenter creating miracles, and today I'd like to share with you another carpenter's story and the grace of God that was in and continues to be in this particular carpenter's work and how humble this carpenter was. For he was a part of God's plan, I believe. So, it's a Christmas, December morning, near Christmas, in 1878. Sunlight is shining across the dusty streets and the adobe houses of Santa Fe. It glowed on the bright tile roof of the almost completed chapel called Our Lady of Light. And the nearby windows of the Catholic convent school that were run by the Sisters of Loretto. Inside the convent, the Mother Superior named Magdalene looked up from her packing as a knock was heard at the door. It's another carpenter, Reverend Mother, said Sister Frances. Her round face with a look of apology. I told him that you were leaving right away and you don't have time to see him. But he says, I know what he says, says Mother Magdalene. He says he's heard about our problem with this new chapel. I'm sure he said he's the best carpenter in all of New Mexico. And I'm sure he thinks he can build us a staircase to the choir lobby despite the fact that the brilliant architect in Paris who drew our chapel plans failed to leave space for any way to get up to the choir loft. Have you told him that five master carpenters have already tried to build the staircase and have failed? No, said Sister Francis, but he really seems like such a nice man. And he's out there with his donkey and I'm sure, interrupted Mother Magdalene, that he's a charming man and he has a, a charming donkey. 
But there's a sickness down at Santa Domingo, Puebla, and it may be cholera. Sister Mary and I are the only ones here who've had cholera, so we both have to go, and you, Sister Frances, have to stay here and run the school. And that's that. Then the mother superior called out to the young Indian girl, Manuela, Manuela, mira, ven para acá, por favor. Which means, look, please come here. A young girl of 12 or 13 with long black hair and smiling comes in quietly on moccasin feet. Manuela, as you see, is unable to speak. It had been so since she was little, but she could hear and understand. The mother superior spoke to her gently and said, Take my things down to the wagon, child. I'll be right there. Then she turned to Sister Frances and said, Please tell your carpenter friend to come back in about two or three weeks. I'll see him when I get back from the Pueblo. Two or three weeks! exclaimed Sister Frances. Surely you'll be home before Christmas. If it's the Lord's will, Sister, I hope so. So in the street, beyond the waiting wagon, Mother Magdalene could see the carpenter, uh, a bearded man. A strongly built man, taller than most, with dark eyes and kind of a tanned, leathery face. Beside him, a small burro stood patiently, and Manuel was there stroking the burro's nose. You'd better explain to that man, Francis, that Manuela cannot speak. Their goodbyes were quick. As Mother Magdalene left the convent, the best time when you leave a place you love. They traveled southwest along the dusty trail. The uh, mountains were purple with shadows. The Rio Grande was a ribbon of green far off to the right. It was a beautiful, beautiful place that they were moving towards. The pace was slow, but Mother Magdalene and Sister Mary amused themselves by singing Christmas carols as they went along. After two days, they were brought to Santo Domingo, Pueblo, where the sickness was not cholera after all, but measles, almost as deadly in this Indian village. They stayed there helping the exhausted priest of the village, Father Sebastian. They visited the adobe hovels where feverish Indian children tossed and turned in the dogs of the village growled and showed their teeth. At night, they were bone weary, but Mother Magdalene was able to find time to talk to Father Sebastian about her plans for the dedication of the new chapel. It would have been dedicated sooner, except that the choir loft had no access, and only a small space existed to place some kind of stairs, and no one had been successful in creating them. The architect created the choir loft rather high up in order for it to go under this beautiful rose window, said Mother Magdalene, almost 22 feet high. Perhaps, sighed Father Sebastian, he had in, in mind a heavenly choir, one with, with wings. It would be interesting for our choir to go up 22 feet every Sunday to their perch. It's not funny, said Mother Superior sharply. I prayed and I prayed, and apparently there is just absolutely no solution at all. There isn't room on the chapel floor for the supports that such a staircase would need. The days passed, and with each passing day, Christmas grew closer. Occasionally, people traveling on horseback between Santa Fe to Albuquerque brought letters from Sister Frances, but Mother Magdalene frowned over certain paragraphs in the letters. Dear Reverend Mother, wrote Sister Frances, all is well at school. Manuela, myself, the other sisters, and the carpenter are becoming fast friends. It's amazing how well he's working. And what thought Mother Magdalene, the carpenter, doing still there? The next letter brought Mother Magdalene more frustration as she read Sister Frances' next letter. 
Early every morning, said the sister, he comes with another load of lumber. And every night he goes away. When we ask him by what authority he does these things, he smiles and says nothing. We've tried to pay him, but he won't accept any money at all. Work? What work? Mother Magdalene wrinkled up her nose in exasperation. Had that kind-hearted Sister Frances given the carpenter permission to work in this new chapel? Mother Magdalene tried to get the disapproving message back up to Santa Fe, but the snow was falling and no one was able to leave the Pueblo. By next morning, the sun was out, glistening on the snow. Mother Magdalene and Sister Mary took the opportunity to leave so they would be at home in time for Christmas. By now, the sickness at Santa Domingo, the measles were subsiding she decided she would come back later. They arrived in the midst of falling snow close to midnight on Christmas Eve. The little girl, Manuela, flew down the steps of the convent, followed by Sister Frances to greet them. But before Mother Magdalene could get out a word, she was being hurried along the corridor into the chapel. Look, Reverend Mother, look! cried Sister Frances. And like a curl of smoke, the newly built staircase rose before them. Nothing seemed to support it. It was as if it was floating on air. There were no rails, no banisters, two complete spirals with polished wood rested at the top against the choir box. The softness of the candlelight, Sister Frances whispered. Thirty-three steps. <coughs> Thirty-three steps in two perfect circles. One step for each year of the life of our Savior. Mother Magdalene stepped forward like a woman in a trance. She put her foot on the first step, and then on the second one, and then on the third. She looked down at Manuela's face, which beaming with a great smile, but, but it's impossible, Mother Magdalene said. There was a time. He finished yesterday, said Sister Francis, and he's gone. No one in Santa Fe has seen him anywhere. But who was he? Mother Superior asked. Silence, absolute silence until this tiny little voice out of nowhere said, oh, Jose. Jose. They all looked at little Manuela, who had been unable to speak, but now said her first word. They made the sign of the cross. There was a great surge of wonder and amazement. Mother Magdalene knew what it was. It was the spirit of Christmas, and it was upon the man. This is the story that the sisters of Loretta carried with them for decades, for a long, long time. Today, this very staircase still stands at the chapel in Santa Fe, just as it was over a hundred years ago when it was dedicated, except for the railing that they put along this wood and they attached the top of the staircase to the balcony. Architects shake their heads trying to figure out how it was built. Tourists stare in marvel. All we know is that a stranger came and built 33 steps, one for each year of Christ's life, two complete turns without any central support. And perhaps the more interesting note, the wood is said to be a hard fir variety which is completely non-existent in New Mexico. It just didn't happen. There was and is no record 
of any sale of wood occurring in New Mexico, and the records are copious from that time. There were no nails, only wooden pegs. In 2002, Mary Jean Straw Cook cited an obituary stating a French carpenter named Francois had built it. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe not. The debate goes on. Did it take weeks? Did it take three months? Did it take eight months? Was there a tiny, narrow, central support that Mary Cook cited in her book that was the reason it was able to be there? The point is, back in those days, architects and engineers today marveled at the exquisiteness of this particular staircase that was not built with modern tools, but old tools, tools that would have been of years and years ago. I'm sure there is a logical explanation for this staircase. But if there is, most people still don't agree on what that logical explanation is. You see, Christmas time is a time to expect miracles. Miracles don't always have to be of the kind that, that, that show us something utterly miraculous. Miracles can be done through you, they can be done through me. You can do a miracle for people around you. People around you may feel you've done a miracle for them, and they don't even know that you are a miracle. People can be a blessing to so many other people. Christmas time is a time to expect miracles. If every day of the year could be a time to expect miracles, our world would look so differently than it does now. But every so often, something pops through. Something kind of shines through that window to let us know that miracles are still possible. So be prepared for God to use you, yes, you, for miracles. Be prepared to be a blessing to others that are not even aware of it. Expect miracles even in a tiny, humble manger where the Savior of the world, the carpenter, the Christ child, was born. So we are left with a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. All of you. Amen.